one and let me just thank you so much for caring enough to come and worship with us on today listen i'm gonna go right to the chase i'm not gonna waste your time i don't like people wasting my time i'm not gonna waste yours i'm so excited to have you worshiping with us i'm so excited about the potential the possibilities of what can come out of the time of celebration of worship on today. And I'm excited about the opportunity to be able to connect with you as we go forward. Throughout the celebration of worship, you'll see different information come on the screen that allows you to be able to engage with us so that we can re-engage with you. We want to stay connected. One of the things I tell the church is that in God, there are no accidents. In God, there are no coincidences. And in God, there are no happenstances. In God, there are only purposeful moments. And today is a purposeful moment. That's why I believe our paths have crossed today. You're about to enjoy a wonderful experience in God and I'm excited about it. Right before you do, I, I have to encourage you uh, to consider purchasing my first book, Bloom Where God Has Planted You. It's time to fulfill your God-given purpose. We promote this book because it is chock full of information, scripture, resources, and even some personal testimonies that can help you along the path and journey of knowing your purpose. And if there's anything that no matter where I go, wherever I travel all over the world, people ask, not because of me, but just ask in general is, what is my purpose? What is the purpose of life? Well, I can't promise all the answers, but I can promise to get you on the journey to discovering and even uncovering your purpose. The information on the screen, you can order the book and I promise you it will bless you. You may even want to get it for a small group discussion. Some churches have done that. Uh, it'll bless your small group as well. Now having said that, let's get ready to go into the celebration of worship. The praise team is ready. The church is ready. And the word is ready also. Bless you. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to World Deliverance Christian Center Time of Worship. We thank you for joining us this morning. Let us know that you're worshiping with us by going and just typing in the word, check in to let us know that you're with us on this morning. We're going to have our Bible verse in our prayer. Isaiah 43. Now this is what the Lord says. He created you people of Jacob. He formed you people of Israel. He says, don't be afraid because I have saved you. I have called you by name and you are mine. So God, we come right now just to say thank you. Lord, we thank you, God, for waking us up this morning, God, and allowing us to see this beautiful day, God, that you have created, God. Lord, I thank you for even allowing us to come together, God, and worship you on this day, God. Lord, we thank you, God, for your mighty and awesome word that will go forth on this day, God. We thank you because it will fall on fertile ground, God. We thank you, God, because we know that lives will be changed on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, WDCC and everyone worshiping with us. If you would like to support WDCC and our missional efforts, you can text your donation amount to 844-713-4622. Again, the number to text is 844-713-4622. If you would like to mail in your investment, you can mail it to PO Box 735, Maywood, Illinois 60153. Also, you can send your donation on our church website, which is worlddeliveredcc.net. Thank you and God bless.
Christ. There is none like him. No one else can do anything like you can do.
bless you and so glad to have you worshiping with us on on today let's look in Luke chapter number two and we're going to read just one verse we're going to cover more than just this one verse we're going to read one verse verse number 49 Luke is in the New Testament it is one of the books of biography of Jesus so the New Testament starts with Matthew then you have Mark then you have Luke Luke the second chapter verse number 49 it reads as follows Jesus said to them why were you looking for me didn't you know I must be about my father's business as it says in the King James but in the new century version it says I must be in my father's house God's word he is already blessed and so are we want to share today uh, from this thought keep up the good work part two we on last Sunday began discussing uh, keep up the good work um, today keep up the good work part number two it is our prayer that all of us are uh, blessed that the unchurched anyone who has not been affiliated with a local church for at least six consecutive months you're considered unchurched and it does not mean you don't love Jesus. It just means you have not been affiliated with, with the church. So my prayer is that you hear the word of God on today and you would want to connect, unite with the church and prayerfully even world deliverance um, is, is you will see that um, we would love to walk with you. Have you walk with us as together uh, we invade the world with salvation, discipleship and nurturing as we bring in those we do not know and build those we do know and then send everyone all of us going back out as disciple makers and giving ourselves away it is my prayer that saints christians those who are part of a church those who uh, worship um, with the local assembly specifically world deliverance but there may be other worshipers from other uh, ministry contexts with us on today and we, we're so glad to have you with us on today uh, but th that you hear the word of the lord and would want to continue to live into or begin to live into if you have not yet done so live into the purpose that God has for your life and he has purpose for all of us and we've shared uh, previously uh, our purpose as Christians is to make disciples and we'll go more into that on on today um, you know what you all my 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 wife and I have a 6-year-old grandson and it's really interesting to witness the development of his communication our our grandson now speaks in full sentences but it was not always that way as a matter of fact um that there were times when it was a little more challenging to understand the words that he was he was saying and so when asked if he were hungry or wanted to do something specific, our grandson would be quick just to give us a two word sentence, not me. And, and what's funny about it is even when the question was just rhetorical, he would be quick to say, not me. So we may say something like, um, we're going outside. He's like, not me. Like, well, no, we didn't ask you if you're going outside. We're telling you we're going outside. Or, or we may say, are you hungry? You know, we're about to eat. Not me. You know, that that was his, his big thing. It was, it was good. And, and so now even in, in our house, when, when he's not around and and something happens, my wife or myself may be quick to say, not me, um, just because it was just so cute and so funny to remember our grandson say, saying that, well, you know what, though, you are too often followers of Christ have the same response to our participation in discipleship. We're quick to say, not me, e e even though the Lord 
gave us a command. We know it as the Great Commission, but it was not just as the Great Commission. He said this at other times uh, when Jesus told us uh, regarding making disciples, but particularly the Great Commission, which was not uh, even a rhetorical question. It, it was not a statement that if you feel like it, it was something he said to those who follow him. Everyone follow him has to go make disciples yet too many of those who are following christ first of all when it comes to being discipled or making disciples we're quick to say not me and it's interesting because the process of being discipled is something that for some reason some think you actually end the, or exit the process at some point but that is an ongoing process because a disciple is an imitator or a follower of jesus guess what none of us ever arrive None of us are ever 100% like Jesus at any point in our sanctified, holy lives. We're never exactly like Jesus, which means we're always being discipled. There's always something in our lives that needs to conform to the image of Jesus. Yet, unfortunately, some get to a point where we say, not me, as if we don't need to be discipled. No. And then some don't want to disciple others for whatever the reason may be. Yet Jesus, whom we should be imitating you all, shows us, and we'll explain it today if we go through the word of the Lord, that it's always the right time to live into God's mission for the world. And let me just say this parenthetically now, in case I don't get the chance to say it later, uh, that salvation was not my idea. Salvation was not your idea. And as much as you may love people, helping people, restoring the world back to God was not your idea. It was God's idea. It's God's mission to restore the world. He created a church to carry out his mission, not among ourselves, but in the world. If the world is going to be re restored and retained and brought back to Jesus, guess what? It has to be through the church that does it in the world, which means it's his mission. And because it's his mission, we can't tell him, not me, because he didn't ask us. He actually created us to fulfill his mission. So the only thing I want to show you today, you all, I'm talk about today is you have to stay focused. Bless your name, Jesus. Yeah, yeah you ju just stay focused. While some uh, like to say Jesus is our example, I, I like to say it's more accurate to say he is our perfect pattern. If you've ever sewn before or or you have uh, cut out any design or anything, you, you place the pattern over, over it and then you cut around the pattern to do your best to ensure that that which you are cutting that which you are making that which you are sewing resembles the original uh pattern that it came from what well, jesus your is our perfect pattern that is we should pattern our lives after him and that which he has done watch this jesus came to the earth you all for a specific reason and understood that the problems you all should never be allowed to prohibit the pursuit of purpose. He came here for a specific reason. And in coming here, he understood, however, that problems should never allow or prevent us from pursuing the purpose for which we have come, for which we have been created, for which God has placed us in his earth. Galatians chapter four, verse number four, it says, but when the right time came, God sent his son who was born of a woman and lived under the law. Verse five, God did this. He's ascending God. He sent Jesus. He did this so that he, Jesus, could buy freedom for those who were under the law and we could become his, some of God's children. Now watch this, you all. While it is true that Jesus was sent to the world, we should not overlook the fact that he was incarnate in the world. Yeah, yeah. He, he was not just sent to the world to die. He was incarnate. He became part of of the fabric of society part of the culture he became one of the boys okay and so john, john chapter 1 verse number 14 says it like this the word became a human and lived among us we saw his glory the glory that belonged to the only son of the father and he was full of grace and truth now this is significant you all because 
the Hebrew people, particularly during Jesus's time, uh, during the first century A.D., um, and, and before then also, but they regarded God with so much respect that his name, Yahweh, they would not even pronounce his name. He, he is holy. And, and, and they regarded him with such high esteem that they said, we can't even pronounce his name. So for someone who would have read what John had written, remember the Bible, we said a few sermons ago, the Bible was written for us, but was not written to us those to whom the bible was written to whom john was writing when they would have read john 1 and 14 and it says that the word god himself the lord became flesh and dwelt among us the god they could not even say his name for for them to know that he moved right down the street from them was a big deal it's a big deal that the god who is so holy that we know we cannot even be in the same area as he is, yet he came to us, that is a big deal. Jesus understood you all the importance of seeking and pursuing God's direction for his life, even in the face of opposition. It's a big deal he came, and even in coming, he pursued the purpose that God had for his life. As such then, watch this now, it is no surprise that the age of 12, after Jesus and his family had traveled from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the Passover, Jesus, first of all, had a fire that did not allow anyone to put out. His fire in him was so strong that no one could take it away or put it out, including Mary and Joseph, his earthly parents. He did not even allow them to prevent him from pursuing his purpose from his heavenly father. Oh, wow, wow, wow. But but then, but in addition, this is so important, additionally, y'all, uh, because Jesus was such a part of the fabric, he was so incarnate into the culture in, 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 as a human that he was not even missed by his parents when they left Jerusalem to go back to Nazareth. I want you to get this, I want you to get this, because some, you know, before you call DCFS or Child Protective Services, talking about they lost their child, how dare they leave their child? Well, it shows you that he was such a part of the community, just part of the family. They had a huge entourage, by the way, that they went from Nazareth to Jerusalem. He was such a part of them that when they left, they thought he was with other part of the entourage. Now, let me just say this parenthetically, because there are some who try to say that as a boy, Jesus did a miracle. I, and I, the Bible doesn't tell us that. And I highly doubt that he did miracles as a boy. I truly believe he was so incarnate that he was just, again, one of the boys. Why? Because you would remember if you had a 12 year old who was walking on water. Don't you play with me. Yeah, somebody say, I know that's right. I know that's right. You will remember if you had a 12-year-old feeding 5,000 people. You will remember that. He said something different about this child right here. Yet he was so ordinary in terms of blending in and being incarnate that they went all, they headed back to a, a, a Nazareth and did not even know after a full day that he was not with the party but then thirdly you all this is what we're saying is significant because jesus stood out in the crowd at the temple let me show it to you in scripture luke chapter 2 verse 41 every year jesus parents went to jerusalem for the passover feast we just told you when he was 12 years old they went to the feast as they always did after the feast days were over they started home the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. We already explained why they did not know it, because he was such a part of the fabric of the, of, the, of the culture and of the family. Verse 46, after three days, they come back, and after three days, you all, they found Jesus sitting in the temple with the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now get this, get this, because in the east where Jesus lived, where they lived, boys at 12 are usually further developed and have a better understanding of the law than those in the west where we live. They just have a much better understanding. Ray Vanderlein, I uh, said it like this, uh, that during the earthly ministry of Jesus, uh, at five years of age, one is fit for the scripture. At 10 years of age, they're fit for the Mishnah or the oral Torah and the, uh, and the interpretation. They hear the oral, uh, uh, oral law, and the, uh, and which provides the interpretations of that which is written. 
at 13 years of age during the time of Jesus, they're, they're fit you all to fulfill the commandments. That is nowadays when a boy sits for his bar, his, his bar mitzvah because that is the fulfilling of the commandments. At 15 years of age during Jesus' time, a boy is fit you all uh, to sit with the Talmud. That is to the making of rabbinic interpretations. He's able to stand and give interpretations as a rabbi. At 18 years of age, they were fit for the bride chamber. At 20 years of age, they were, uh, they were fit to pursue a vocation. And at 30 years of age, during the time of Jesus, they were fit for authority, or now they were able to teach others. He was such a part of of the community, of the culture, that he did not deter or stray, even though he was God in the flesh. He did not deter or stray away from what the culture called for. Even at the age of 12 then, you all, Jesus was still Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, he stuck, to, stuck to what the culture called for, but he's still Jesus, which means he still was omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, spiritually omnipresent. Physically, he was in one place at the time, at one time, but spiritually, he's able to be all places at the same time with all of his essence. Why is that important, Pastor? Well, here's why it's important to know that Jesus was still Jesus. Imagine you all how Jesus must have felt as he was walking into the temple full of wisdom from studying since the age of five up until now age 12 studying the law the torah the mishnah studying all of this you all and and also the knowledge that the words that he has studied and the words people were speaking in the temple actually had come from him they were about him and had come from him i uh, want you put yourself in his position for a second but then also you all imagine how he must have felt walking in knowing that even though he had come uh, with Joseph and Mary for one purpose that is to observe the Passover that he stayed you all for another purpose that is to be about the business that which God sent him and so because of that even in their absence that did not deter him from fulfilling or accomplishing the purpose for which he had come let me take that a step further I just told you Jesus was omniscient. That is, he has all knowledge. That includes you all. He knew the future of the people he was talking to in the temple. I want that to sink in for a second. I want to sink in for a second. The, some of the people, I dare say, just a mere 21 years later, may have been some of the same ones when at the age of 33, they would be the ones shouting, crucify him. Mm. And, and, and I want you to imagine for one second, Jesus sitting there talking to people in the temple or seeing people walk by him in the temple, seeing people walk around Jerusalem, seeing the leaders and future leaders who would, who would want to shout crucify him, those who he would help, who would come back and hate him or treat him with such contempt. And yet, and he knows this, he knows it's about them. He does not just know what they had done because he's omniscient, he knows what they're going to do. Yet, you all, that did not prevent him from fulfilling his purpose by sitting there sharing the word of God with them then. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Somebody say he was focused. He was he just how he was focused. Jesus was focused. Yeah. 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 Let me take it a step further. Why, why, why that should matter to us? Because the most we can know about other people, you all, is the past. And that is only seen from our perspective. Recently, our missional groups uh, with, with the, the, the information that they were studying shared their story uh, of, of, of their past. And, what, and I dare say what it did for those in the missional group, it allowed them to not only see the past of other people from their personal perspective, but from the individual's perspective. And when you see things from someone else's perspective, it gives you a new appreciation and understanding of sometimes why people are how they are and do what they do, which should give us more sensitivity when dealing with people. But without having that, all we know is the past we see someone else has from our perspective. And oftentimes, if we're honest, our knowledge of their past from our perspective often is a hindrance to us 
fulfilling our purpose in their lives. Oh my gosh. And don't you play with me how many times because what we know about somebody else's past, we don't want to deal with them in the present. Oh wow, wow. Well, while I got you, let me take a step further. In fact, I find it interesting that as much as many of those who walk with Jesus are excited that God has a future and a hope for us. We like to talk about he has a future and he knows a thought he thinks towards us that despite our past, he has great plans of peace for us, thoughts to not, not to hinder us or harm us, but give us a future and a hope. And we shout about the fact that despite my past, I have great future and hope with him, yet we keep holding on to other people's past. Y'all miss that. He knows our future, yet he has great future for us. He knows the mistakes, the sin, the problems, the lies, the cussing, the, even sometimes the hatred we're going to exhibit in the future. Yet he says, I got great hope for your future. I provide expectation for your future. All we know is someone's past and we cut them off in their future. Oh, my gosh. I, it's interesting, you all, uh, that those who are glad that he does not only not only hold our past against us, but he does not hold our future sins against us. Yet we still hold people's past against them as if they don't have hope for the future themselves from God. Wow. Wow. And so oftentimes when it comes time to disciple them, to love them, to help them, we're quick to do a DJ and say, not me, <laughs> not me. And he said, I didn't ask you, could you or would you? I told you to do it. I told you to restore them. Let, let, let me show you in scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone belongs to Christ, there is a new creation. The old things have gone. Everything is made new. All this is from God. Through Christ, God made peace between us and himself. And God gave us the work of telling everyone about the peace we can have with him. God was in Christ, making peace between the world and himself. In Christ, God did not hold the world guilty of his sins. And he gave us this message of peace. This is what he gave to us, you all. Verse 20, so we have been sent to speak for Christ. Get that now. It is as if God is calling you through us. That is, he's speaking to other people through us. We speak for Christ when we beg you to be at peace with God. And that's what we have to do, you all. We have to help others have peace with God by extending the peace he gave us to them, which means then, you all, our job, despite what someone has done in the past, is to invite them into God's witness protection program. <laughs> and like a good witness protection program, it changes your name, it changes your identity, it changes your residence, and it gives you new hope for right now. Despite what you've done in the past, you have a great future. That's what a good witness protection program does. It gives you a new everything. And just like God did it for us. We must do that for someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Joseph and Mary, watch it. Joseph and Mary, you all, uh, finally, talking about Jesus' earthly parents, finally discovered that Jesus was not in the entourage, not with the crowd, and they returned back to, to, to Jerusalem looking for him. When they get there, the Bible tells us Mary scolds him. How many times, just, just ask this parenthetically, how many times have we left the place of worship and our actions showed we didn't take the Lord with us. Wow. Wow. Before again, before somebody wants to trip on Mary and Joseph, I don't care. Pastor, they should have known a child. Even when doing Mary known a child. Well, how many times have some who worshiping right now left church and the actions that we've been carried out show we didn't take Jesus with us? <laughs> Well, well, let me just tell you right now, though, he is not relegated to a particular place. For anyone uh, who thinks that you can't worship, we, we invite you uh, to, to, to engage with us and even to, to begin to walk this journey with us. And you think, well, I'm going to wait till we get back into a place to do that. Let me tell you right now, he is not, nor has he ever been relegated to a particular place. In Second Chronicles chapter 6, starting in verse number 18, this is what God asked, uh, Solomon asked God to do in the dedication of the temple. He says, but God, can you really live here on earth with people? The sky in the highest place in heaven cannot contain you. Surely this house which I have built cannot contain you. Solomon was saying you all at the dedication of the temple that you know what? 
I know not even the earth can contain you. The heavens can contain you. So surely this building can contain you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not relegated to a particular place, you all. Adolescent Jesus here in the text shows us that the misunderstandings of people, including those with whom we are connected, should not change our obligation to fulfill the missio day. That is the mission of God, which is to redeem the world. Remember, it's God's mission, not ours. And so no matter what anyone else does, we have to stay focused and not let other people's misunderstanding or their lack of assistance in our lives prevent prevent us from fulfilling God's mission of redeeming the earth. Luke 2 49, Jesus said to them, talking about his earthly parents, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? You should have known where I was going to be, what I was going to be doing. Mary and Joseph had been told more than 12 years prior that Mary would give birth to the son of God and to the world. Watch this. Her, Mary's purpose was to present Jesus to the world. <laughs> purpose don't change no matter who we are. Her purpose was to present Jesus to the world. Well, he was born and here we find themselves more than 12 years later and life has taken over. And Mary fell into a routine of being Joseph's wife while Joseph worked on his craft as a carpenter. They focus more, you all, on their mission and less on the mission of God. The more she was a good wife and he was a good carpenter, the less they were presenting Jesus and sharing Jesus with the world to the extent that when they found Jesus sharing himself with the world, they tried to check him saying, what are you doing? <laughs> Let me take this uh, a, a little bit further. Jesus, however, reset their purpose by reminding them and us that the mission is God's not ours oh bless your name Jesus and whatever God's mission is that should become our mission as well you see y'all sometimes those who are closest to us don't always understand that there is more to us than what they see and sometimes the people we're closest to, we don't always understand there's more to them than what we see. We should stay focused, you all, on that which God has called us to do and not allow our connection to people or the drama of life to distract us from pursuing our purpose of making disciples as we present Jesus to the world. It ain't just about that. That's why we can't say our gift is our purpose because some of us, our gift is preaching or whatever it may be, and we share Jesus, but it goes deeper than that. Yes, we can help people know about him by sharing him like this, but we must make disciples as we share Jesus with the world. See, like Jesus, you all, there must be a fire inside of us that is greater than the confusion that's around us. Oh my gosh. And all of us have some confusion, some drama, but the fire within has to be greater than the drama on the outside of us. Let me take it a step further. God has already done his part by gifting us and positioning us so that we can be successful. Yeah, hey, I wish somebody would just put in the chat right now. I just want to be successful. I just, I just want to be so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God has positioned us though, because more than you want to be successful, God wants us to be successful. Which means we now should commit to doing our part by representing Jesus in this broken world. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Let me help you understand how this happens. Then, Emmanuel. Uh, Ken Togale and Chris Rice wrote in their book, Reconciling All Things, that the first language of the church, you all, in a deeply broken world is not strategy. It actually is prayer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But not just any prayer. Bless your name, Jesus. A desperate cry of lament that is directed you all to God and then followed by action on our part. So it's not us just let now I lay me down to sleep and going to sleep. No, it's a cry of lament. And then we follow it with action to live out what we've been praying. It is during the prayer of lament that we can unlearn what we must unlearn and learn that what we must learn. What does that mean, Pastor? Well, some of the things we have to unlearn, you all, we have to we have to unlearn, you all, speed, 
distance and innocence. We have to unlearn those things. It is only when we lament from our place of pain that we unlearn speed and see the need for time to be added in for growth, time for forgiveness, and time to learn how to love. Now, let me just say this parenthetically, because this does not give us an, an excuse to say, say, yeah, I need time. I need time for this. No, I ain't talking about us making an excuse saying some things take time. No, it, it is it is as we lament. We slow everything down and we live into and take the time necessary there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The time necessary so that you all, we learn how you all uh, to slow things down and grow. Oh my gosh, not just grow in ourselves, but grow and let other people grow. We slow things down. We slow things down, you all, and we actually forgive. See, true forgiveness doesn't mean you forget what someone has done. True forgiveness takes time, but you have to invest the time also because even though I can remember what you did, I don't hold it against you. Remember what I told you, Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus, omniscient Jesus, he knows the future of the people he's talking to. Some of them will be the leaders who will later want him crucified, yet Time is there. He says, I got time to forgive you. I have time to live into this and, and do what is necessary so for true forgiveness can take place. And that's what he wants us to do. But then also time, you all, we unlearn speed and we take time to learn how to love, to truly invest and love people like God wants them to be loved. It's only when we, you all learn to lament from our place of pain that we unlearn distance and we draw close to the hurting, close to those who have pain, close to those who are oppressed. Because the truth of the matter is you cannot help anybody else from a distance. Wow. Wow. I, I know we want to keep people at arm's length because ain't nobody going to hurt me. But let me tell you right now, why was he incarnate? Because he says you can't really help people with your arms stretched out. You got to be willing to embrace. You got to get close. to, to and, a, and that's only a prayer of lament that, that helps us stay focused so that we can get close to people. We unlearn the distance we try to keep from people and we get close up, close enough not just to Feel the pain, but close enough you all to have empathy with it, to feel what they feel and to do something about it. But then you all, it's only when we learn you all how to pray a prayer of lament out of our pain that all of a sudden you all, we are truly part of the restoration and we stop you all with the innocence, the claim of innocence. You know the claim of innocence where everything happens and we do the DJ, not me, not me, not me. But let me tell you, let, let's, be, let's be all the way honest. A lot of the pain we see in the world right now, you know what the church was when it happened? Right there when it happened. Yeah, I, I, I know we want to create distance or, or innocence that is to pretend we don't know anything about it. We were right there. Sometimes we were right there making it happen, helping it happen. And we have to be honest at our part in the, in, in, in the problems and the pain that the world is experiencing right now. We, the church has to be honest and is part of in racism. Wow. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I said that. Uh -huh. Yeah, the church has to be honest in, in its problem with, with pornography. The church has to be honest in the problem you all with prostitution, because I know the church wants to pretend not me, but the church has to be honest. And sometimes even when the church didn't do it, the church was silent about it. And we have to stop pretending we're so innocent. And the cry of lament helps us unlearn the innocence to say, you know what, God? Mm, I have not tried to make disciples like I need to make disciples because had I been making disciples like you said make disciples perhaps pornography wouldn't be so bad perhaps drug wouldn't be so bad perhaps violence wouldn't be so bad perhaps the, the what's going on wouldn't be so bad if if just the church had not either a participated or be been silent about it oh my gosh like Jesus though we must slow down Get close, you all, and feel what other people feel, even if everyone else is rushing to get back to Jerusalem or back to, to Nazareth or back to normal. <laughs> if everyone is rushing to get back to the holy place or the home place or the normal place, we got to slow down and say, no, 
I have work to do. I, I have to be about my father's business. I, I have to live into my purpose. Let, let, let me conclude. Let me conclude. Let me conclude. Let me conclude. Jesus showed us that no one, not even his earthly parents, would prevent him, you all, uh, from pursuing the purpose God gave him. Please don't waste your time trying to convince people to help you or give you permission to live into your purpose. If people don't want to help you, it's still your purpose from God to live into. Your purpose comes from God and not anyone else. So please stay focused on what God has called you to do. If no one else agrees to assist you, God still will equip. That's what he's done. He's equipped us, you all. He calls us. He equips us and he expects that we would do that which he has purposed us to do. But also don't allow what we know about anyone else to cause us not to fulfill our God-given purpose. Mm, wow. Wow. Like Jesus. We can know what's going to happen and still live into our purpose. The challenge this week then is for followers of Jesus to slow down, shorten the distance with others and enter into their place of brokenness. Go in with your eyes wide open. I'm entering brokenness with you. You're not in the same by yourself. And for those who don't follow Jesus to allow followers of Christ to bring his peace into your life he wants you to have true shalom true peace and when you have that restoration reconciliation and even discipleship can begin god bless you god bless you thank you for worshiping with us as the word was shared and, and it's my prayer that something was said that touched you immensely and to the point that you want to follow Christ with us. Each week we, we share the invitation for you to do just that. And there's some who've taken us up, us up on it and there's some who uh, maybe you still in a wait and see mode. I, I want to encourage you to come on live into your purpose. I just told you in, in the word of the Lord uh, that it's not about a place because no place can contain God. It is about the your purpose and being positioned and the relationship. He wants you to have that right relationship with him. So you can just text the word disciple to the number that's on the screen. And we would love to, to have you to follow Christ with us. He would love to have you follow him with us why why with someone because it's with others you can not only have accountability but you also can have someone who can help build you help encourage you and help walk with you as you follow jesus it gets challenging for all of us remember we have to unlearn innocence we have to pre now stop pretending that butter came out in our mouths and realize, no, we're not innocent, but we're also being called not guilty. <laughs> That's the beautiful thing about it. He doesn't say we're innocent, but because what Jesus did, he says, but you're not guilty. Because he took it. He, he, he came up close with us, took on our sin, and now allows us to share that with someone else and not only are we sharing that with you we want you to help us as we share with others text the word disciple and you can begin the journey with us god bless you hey god bless you i just want to let you know how much i thoroughly appreciate you trusting us with your time. Thank you so much for being here with us on today. And hopefully you know I'm a man of my word. I said we weren't gonna waste your time. And hopefully not only did not waste your time, but you consider it time well spent. And actually that we've added value 
to the time you spent with us today. Before I let you go, let me just remind you about the first book, Bloom, where God has planted you. It's time to fulfill your God-given purpose. And if there's anything we ever needed to know right now, we need to know what our purpose is from God. You can order the book. You even can, for some, use it for small group discussions. Some churches actually have done that. And a group of you all can discuss your purpose from God. Again, thank you for being with us. Stay on to the end, again, to see the various platforms where you can interact with us and engage with us. And I promise you, if you reach out, we will reach back out to you also. Oh, one more thing. When you post, I try to read every post. I'm doing best to respond. So go ahead and, and drop a comment. I'll correspond with you.